All right, Ben is here. That can only mean one thing, which is a third episode of basketball, beer, comics, and more. Um, it, it's a whole series now. It's a tri trilogy. Um, how are you doing, Ben? I'm, I'm doing great. And uh, it is only a trilogy for now. Uh, I, I don't foresee this going away anywhere. But this is a very special episode, Torsten. Do you know why this is a very special episode? Um, I have no idea. Tell me. This is a very special episode because this is the first time that my Boston Celtics were victorious against the Warriors. This is the first edition for comics, basketball, and beer that the Boston Celtics, the good guys, finally prevailed. And we got to talk about a book you chose. We do. And, and, and uh, I wanted to wear my new shirt that, that um i was sent right <laughs> but <laughs> it's uh i i appreciate you making you know uh doing the the celtics kelly green so oh no 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 you can keep it oh okay i met german fc you know i'm fine with that i'm fine with that german fc nothing wrong with that that's which uh which year was that i think it was 2016 and because we're okay. talking about a german book by the way Spoilers for the Ring of the Nibelung um, <laughs> coming up. That's the book we're going to talk about because it's a book I picked for multiple reasons. Um, but yeah, you were supposed to wear your German jersey. <laughs> so, I, uh, I I I was just so excited uh, to do this. Uh, you know, if if you want to pause real quick, I can no, go no. upstairs and grab Let it. Me, but I, 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 that's all good. You, I'll, I'll you've got mine. enough. You've got enough German jersey for both of us. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take that off. Don't worry. That's better. Coming back around with the Warriors. So I, I wore, I think I wore clay the first time, um, Steph the second. Yeah, you, oh, we, we had a whole discussion because you were wearing the the pre-blue and gold jerseys that uh, they had now when we were talking about what was the year that they opt the, the last of the George Carl Nuggets. So we went on a whole tangent with just what year was that. So yeah, back to the, uh, the classic uh, blue and gold. The blue and gold, and that is actually fitting the occasion. Um, that's a Christmas jersey um, from I think 2017, um, and they—that's the only game they played. Only one game in that jersey, and obviously they lost that game. So they—they um, they were even at their peak, they were never good on Christmas. I think they, they hardly ever won a Christmas game um, during their initial run um, in 2015, 16, 17. Uh, well, they're also not very good when they're not playing in Golden State. What is going on with your boys this year? They they are horrible on the road. Um, they 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 are great at home, but um, yeah, um, uh, they lost yesterday um, to to Memphis. Memphis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they had the weirdest altercation with Dylan Brooks and uh, Draymond. Did you see the video of that? Um, I I. The, the, I saw Draymond's response to you, the Brooks, like initially tweeting or making a comment, and Draymond made a re, uh, response video in his, I guess, podcast. Um, but I did not watch the game yesterday because we had the movie clip. I, I will send you a clip of of them on the court together because it is the it is the weirdest thing, man. Um, <laughs> Can only imagine. Yeah, it turns out uh, Dylan Brooks and uh, Draymond getting weird on court situations. Who'd have thought, right? There's got to be someone, right? Like someone's, someone's got to match it up with, with Draymond. You know who it is on our team. Like it always is interesting. Oh, it's Jordan who, who it is going to be on the other team? <laughs> uh, but yeah, the Warriors lost to the Celtics for the first time since we um, started betting on those games. Um, and I was just looking it up because the game was was about two months ago, like January 19th. Back then, the Warriors were sixth in the West. Um, they still are. <laughs> the Celtics used to be first in the league. Now they're second in the East, but they're still very much up there um, I'm, contending. I'm not worried about my Celtics. They've, they've had a rough week. All right. Um, plus, other teams did big moves during the um, trade um, period. 
and the Celtics did not really. Um, no, I mean their their big move was uh, in the off season when they picked up Malcolm Brogdon, but yeah, they did. Um, they picked up Mike Muscala from uh, OKC. Um, he's been a, a nice bench piece, you know, another uh, another shooter uh, that's that's going in on there, uh, kind of just bolstering a little bit of that depth. But yeah, so basically since the All Star break, they have been terrible at closing out games. I mean, the way that we used to joke that like they need to get rid of the third quarter. And, uh, and the Celtics would be fine. It's like that with the fourth quarter, right? Like up until five minutes, they're looking good. They're leading. And then it's just, it's almost like they feel like they're just playing out the, the rest of the season. It's almost like, you know, oh, we got to the finals last year. We were the number one seed. Like they kind of forgot that they haven't won anything yet. So like I went to the game on Monday when they came here in, uh, in Cleveland and they were, they were up big on that one. Grant Williams misses the two uh, free throws to end the game. It goes into overtime. They lose it there. Granted, they didn't have Tatum, but like all of these games that should be wins, they're, you know, they blew a 28 point lead in the second quarter to Brooklyn, who, in case you, you do not remember, doesn't have Katie or Kyrie. Yep. So I, you know, there's, there's still some season left. We're in the playoffs, but I'm, I'm getting a little worried about what I'm seeing from my boys. Maybe they're starting to rest for the playoffs, which is a wise decision. That's how we lost 2016 by like just going for the record, winning 73 games, and then we're completely exhausted and injured um, during the playoffs. And obviously hey, but they, not they always have that regular season record that nobody remembers anymore. I, I do. I, I do remember that. <laughs> I will forever remember that season because, yeah, we went to game seven and yeah. it was not pretty. Um, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> trying to ignore or forget it, but it keeps coming back. Um, you know what helps speaking... you forget, by the way? Are we beer. talking about beer already? <laughs> beer helps you forget. And I am so excited to show you what I chose. All right. Beer. So do you, would you like to share uh, yours first? Because you kind of, you know, you previewed it a little bit last night. Yeah, it's, it's going to be quick because I have nothing to say other than it's one of the reasons why I picked the German book um, or a German story, not a German book, um, American authors. It's like I can finally drink some proper beer. So I got a Königspilsner, I got a Radeberger and a Warsteiner. And it's... Um, where I left it at that well, was like, should I pick up more? It's like, nah, I know how you, <laughs> but yeah, no, um, those are mine. Uh, my, my little collection of, of German beers, um, according to the book we're going to discuss. Excellent selection. I'm, I'm personally a, uh, I'm a big Dunkelweizen fan. So I, you know, wish, uh, wish you had some of that, but you know, that's, that's for you to drink, not for me to drink. Um, now, for me, as soon as I saw what the book was, I knew what I was getting. Now, Torsten, uh, you're familiar with Wagner's The Ring, are you not? Uh, I am, I am. So what is, you know, it is, of course, broken into four different parts. What is part one? Part one is Das Rheingold. So you got, you das got a coach? Rheingold. And, and could you tell the people, the good people out there, what is the Rhine? The Rhine is the second largest river in um, Europe, um, Germany, Europe, one of the other. Uh, it's a very significant, it's probably the most significant um, river um, in Germany or in Europe in general, because that's where um, the, basically the German auth, um, the German origin uh, was formed. Um, the Roman Empire pushed past the Rhine um, and the first efforts of German tribes getting together um, around like, I think nine after death AD, nine AD, um, the uh, Arminius was gathering German tribes and were pushing the Roman Empire back um, south of the Rhine. And the Rhine became basically the natural border between the Roman Empire and the German tribes uh, where it stood for the next few hundred years until the Roman Empire fell. But um, along the Rhine, you still find um, many um, 
fortresses, um, fortifications um, of the Roman Empire, and it has a big significance in not only German lore, in just history, and it's a mystical place, basically, you have um, all those legends and stories about it. Um, and so in, in the ring and other um, yeah, stories where the Rhine plays a big role um, in, in the mythos. Beautifully said. Um, as you said, it is a it is a mystical place in this story. I mean, without the Rhine, we we have no story. And we have the Rhine maidens who are, of course, protecting their gold, the Rhine gold, das Rhine gold that starts off with. But and I'm I'm spoiling a little bit here. The Rhine gold, das Rhine gold, is stolen by the Nibelung. And and when it is taken, it is is taken away from them. They don't have it anymore. All that's left is, is the spirit, the, the memory, that, that essence, maybe, maybe even a geist, you might say, a geist of that gold. And so what better to read than a beer by Rheingeist Brewery? So this is a brewery in Cincinnati. Um, it, is, uh, it, it started as a producer of fine German ales. And then as uh, happens with most American beers, they said, oh, people aren't drinking those as much. Let's make lots of beers that people like. Uh, so they're one of the big uh, breweries in the area, but they have kept the name. Uh, there's a very large Germanic population in Cincinnati. There's, there's entire uh, populations there. So I knew that when we were doing this, I had to get a Rheingeist to talk about uh, Das Rheingold. And of course, I had to get the closest thing I could find to a golden ale. So we have a golden ale for the Rhine gold that was stolen. That's amazing. And that's on point, um, better than my Bavarian beers. Uh, and um, so Rheingeist, that could mean both two things. It's like the ghost of the Rhine or it could mean the mind of the Rhine, which I think it's the latter. Um, like according to like similar to Zeitgeist, um, Rheingeist. So that's, I, I, I can't wait uh, to see what you have for the second, third and fourth part. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's just oh, one. No, okay. no, no. We're, because, of course, the, the Rhine gold is the throughway through the whole story. You know, the, the first is. Is, is the stealing of it, whatnot. But the, the book itself, Prost. Prost. The, uh, the book itself is called The Ring of the Nibelung. I mean, and that ring is fashioned from the Rheingold. So I, I did, trust me, I, I spent all my creative energy on, on conducting the narrative around uh, Das Rheingeist right here. I, I did not have enough to be like, all right, what, what am I doing for the Valkyrie? Uh, you have a winged, winged... Uh, a Viking, uh, Viking saga beer. <laughs> yeah, and, and Gatha Damerung. Uh, yeah, it turns out there's not a, a whole lot of Gatha Damerung. I mean, I could do, um, you know, for, uh, for the killer last time I did uh, La Fin du Monde, The End of the World. Uh, I could I could bring that one back, but I feel like we've already showcased that one. I, I can't just have that going on. So no, we're just we're sticking with Das Rheingeist. Perfect. At the very least, we'd be lost at at Siegfried um, to find <laughs> one that matches. <laughs> so I mean, I think with that, I, I don't think there's anywhere to uh, else to go but to uh, to start right in. Well, actually, I guess before we get into mm -hmm. um, Das Rheingold. Uh, Torsten, you you had a familiarity with the story of the ring. Can you can you kind of just set the table? You know, going into this here, what was your background with the ring, both musically and sort of the the classic themes, the stories, and, and everything like that? Yeah. Um, so my first exposure, the first time I heard about this story, was in in school, I, like tenth grade. Um, I know in the US that's called a little bit different. Uh, is that soph sophomore year or it's it's so called tenth grade? Or, yeah, I, fresh. Yeah. We we refer to uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. But if you say tenth grade, everybody knows what you're talking about. Cool. So um, our German teacher he was talking about actually not the ring, um, uh, about some of the material the the ring is inspired by, which is the lay of the Nibelung. 
Um, okay. It's a, so one step back. Um, so Richard Wagner, he has like three big inspirations here. He has the Volkungsager. He has obviously the, the Germanic um, God. Um, and um, he has the, the song of the Nibelung or the lay of the Nibelung, like there are different translations, um, which is very interesting. It is a poem. Um, if you want to read that poem, I don't know where you can find, I couldn't find where you could actually read the actual poem. Um, it dates back to the original, um, the, the events it's based on date back to the fifth and sixth century. Um, it was written uh, around 1200. Um, and it's a poem that you can listen to it on Audible. Okay. It's 11 hours. <laughs> You got to spare 11 hours you're not doing anything with. Yeah, uh, especially in poem form. Um, so that's, and, and so our, our um, German teacher, he um, referred to Siegfried, the hero of that saga, um, who slayed a dragon and uh, was covered by, by the dragon's blood after slaying it. So he like basically um, killed it with his sword. The blood um, ran, ran all over him. Um, which Spoilers gave for him books free, man. No, 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 no. That's not really. Because <laughs> that's so that's the lay of the needle. Wagner changes this up a little bit, right? Like he doesn't not bathe, it gets in his mouth. He's not bathed, um, and and it doesn't have the same effect, similar effect, but yeah, not, not exactly the same. So a leaf from a um, linden tree um, lands on his back, and that's basically his vulnerable spot. So he, okay. as he was talking about the story, like it somewhat always stuck with me. It's like, that's the only time I ever heard that story, but I kept for the next 10, 15 years. I was like, where does this story come from? And you, you hear about like the, Nibel, the ring of the Nibelung or the, the song of the Nibelungs um, about those two epics. And to, in my mind, it was always the same. It was like, okay, there's one story about the Nibelung. Um, uh, until I started actually doing the research, because even after over a decade, it didn't it didn't get it out of my head. I was like, always kept coming back. It's like I, I got to know more about this epic saga that everyone should probably know about. Um, and that's where I started doing the research. And it's like, oh no, those are two different stories. One is a poem, just like goes on forever and is like longer than than some novel. Um, and the other one is the Ring of the Nibelung that um, takes inspiration um or wagner takes a lot of elements from there um, but that's that was my first exposure um and then from there i wanted to know more about it um couldn't really find any materials there until a few years ago there was a, a, a series um released also on audible it's in german so um for only english speakers a little bit difficult to get access to that um material um but basically the four um cycle or the four operas um are being translated or rewritten into like a novel form like just a story like they they just um outline the story or read the story as if it was um yeah a book and, and not an opera um which to me was the first time i could actually access that material because I, i've never been to the opera um i would have never um, even if I had gone, because it's like the biggest opera there is, right? Like if I go to an opera, it's probably that one. You wouldn't have access to it that much because uh, it's hard to understand, um, even for a native speaker. <laughs> like you, if I go to the opera, I don't, I can't follow the story. I don't get what, what this is about. Um, so to me, it was the perfect opportunity to get into um, the story by having that like adapt uh, adaptation in novel form and then from there a few years later i found out that there was a comic released or actually two comics that were released um and to the credit of the medium comic that's what i love about comics as well like there's one big reason why i picked this book just to show that comics they serve a very specific and great function in which they can make material accessible to readers um, that don't have access to that. Like 
I wouldn't expect anyone to go to the opera just to learn about the ring um, or read a German novel. Um, and the co comic adaptation makes it so accessible for people that otherwise would have never been introduced to it. And uh, since uh, I, I showed off before, um, this is right here. Uh, what started all of this, this was the book that you sent me um, for, uh, for this actual book club. And then I, and of course you've got it in the, uh, the original. Now, are those prestige format? Are those perfect bound? Because I, you know, they're they are. yeah. Okay, they're I was going to say they're obviously fine. longer because there's only four of these that make it up, and they're like 48 page, page, yeah. pages and each. So we did that one, which is the the Gil Kane and uh, Roy Thomas version, and then I I discovered this one um, simply by I I used to back before uh, work became insane. Um, I uh, do a little bit of comic reading at work um, on on some downtime. In fact, there were during like really slow periods. I I just joked that I was a professional comic reader more than my actual job, and I was looking to see if this was on Hoopla because a lot of times what I'll do is I'll kind of jump back and forth where I'll read some of it digitally and then I'll pick it up when I get home. Um, and I didn't find this, but I did find this version right here, which is the P. Craig Russell version of uh of the ring put out by dark horse and done entirely by p craig russell um it's also like at least twice the length of this and i, I think that's going to be important when we talk about the the differences between the two of them yes i'm not going to show them all separately but yeah i have them all in single issues mainly because um yeah not affordable um if you buy the, i think the hardcover goes for 400 bucks um, and the trade paperback is also somewhere. I, I saw hundred. I, I looked online, like I looked on eBay and you can, it looks, I didn't see any copies of the hardcover, but uh, I, I saw a few listings for the paperback and they were all sitting right at a hundred. And of course it was a, a base price of uh, $25 for the book. So it's, it's gone up from there. Um, so you you talked about you know obviously you you know you have this background you learned about it through school like you had you know this you know going on there uh the ring is it, at least in american culture i feel like there's a sort of passing knowledge of the ring as sort of like a you know this this classic um but it i, I don't I, I don't think we were ever taught either in a literature class, in a music class or anything like that, anything about the ring in particular. Like it, it's just one of those things that it's so famous that you kind of absorb different parts of it through just sort of general knowledge. So, I mean, of course, Flight of the Valkyrie, which is part of, uh, you know, uh, part two, uh, the Valkyrie, one of the most famous pieces of music of, you know, the last Millennium, um, you know, you you hear that dun 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 like everybody knows what that is, um, and then you know the the basic pieces of the hero Siegfried uh, slaying a dragon uh, to you know awaken his beloved Brunhild. Uh, in this country, we often call her Brunhilda, uh, very incorrectly. There's the term it's it ain't over till the fat lady sings. There's like all these individual pieces that come from the ring, but it you like you know. So when you gave me this, it was you know first off, I was shocked. I was like, I did not know that this existed. If anyone watched their reaction video, it's just kind of me going like. Like I felt after the fact, like it was the clay toaster thing being like, what? And, and just being like, I, this exists? Like I, it never would have been a million years occurred to me that this was a thing, but I'm really glad we did this because just like going through, there were so many things that struck me where I'm just like, I did not know this came from here and, and we'll kind of get through there. But there's like, this is so inspirational for so many things that people know. And it's just like, okay, yep, yep, I see, I see that. Oh, very clearly this is that and, and going through it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I want to talk about that um, um, particularly, but uh, as you say, we can talk about it later because yeah, yeah I have my thoughts about the inspiration. Um, because yeah, I heard like I think Josh on on Discord, he he mentions like I want to read this because this this inspired so many great things. It's like that's that's debatable though. Um, but we can, I mean, 
do, do you want to we can list the things that it might may or may not have inspired um so yeah uh, so right off the bat where i was going with that is very very clearly um tolkien takes some inspiration from the ring of the nibelung for the lord of the rings like particularly the Gollum character is ripped right up from you know the nibelung of the story there you know a magic ring that you know when paired with the tarn helm allows its user to change its shape have immense power including invisibility he's haunted by you know by possessing it and the power that's there he lusts for it you know th the through line of the story is the return of of this particular ring like it's and you know he's this twisted and deformed character who's given up everything in order to possess the ring you know the very beginning of this is him renouncing love like i think very very clearly the Gollum character is you know at the there's a ton of inspiration that's going on there would you would you agree with that um I do not know. Um, okay. So Tolkien said he was not inspired by Wagner, which you can take either way. I I understand why he said that, um, because so short history lesson: Hitler used Wagner a lot in his propaganda. It, it um, very famously was uh, his favorite opera. Yeah, uh, he had a lot. Um, ad, Hitler did um, a lot of advisors that said no, you shouldn't, because we when we get into the actual story later and the meaning. It's like it wouldn't help Hitler's efforts. Like the, it's like the downfall of <laughs> of, that, uh, of everything, um, um, and 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 the way um, certain characters are being portrayed and treated. That being said, um, that's that's what Hitler Hitler utilized Wagner and um, obviously Tolkien living through the Second World War and writing the, um, the Lord of the Rings during that time can't admit that Wagner is his inspiration. Um, on the other side, again, Wagner had a, took a lot of inspiration or just took characters right from the Lay of the Nibelung, from the Fölsung uh, saga and from just the god Lord, like the Teutonic, Germanic, Norse um, mythology. Um, I can do give you a quick rundown. I took some notes after going th after listening to the Lay of the Nibelung. Um, again, not a poem, actually a novel. Um, so I, I just did that a few weeks ago, and it was crazy to see the overlays. Again, this is five over five hundred years before Wagner. So the, the, the lay of the Libanon, the, the story goes, Siegfried, so Siegfried in this is a prince. Um, he is sent to the Nibelung, um, the kingdom of dwarves, to learn humility. He defeats a dragon and becomes inv invulnerable after like the blood spills over his body. Um, Siegfried then becomes friends with the Burgund and Gunther and Hagen um, and fights along their sides. Siegfried then marries Kriemhild, which is, um, basically um, Gunther's sister. Um, from uh, uh, from Gotha Demerung. Yeah, they did, he, Wagner changed the name, but it's basically Kriemhild in the layer of, of the Nibelung. Um, then he uses the Tarnhelm, which also exists in that story, um, to make Brunhild fall in love with Gunther. Um, Brunhild then learns about that and demands revenge. Hagen and Gunther kill Siegfried um, and the treasure, like prior in that story, you Siegfried had won the, the uh, treasure, um, the hoard of the Nibelung, um, so all the gold. Then the gold goes to the sister, um, Siegfried's widow. Um, Hagen steals it and dumps it into the Rhine. Um, Kriemhild then marries e um, Etzel, who is like basically the character of Attila, because um, they're, they're all based on like real, um, real figures in history. Um, Cream hits invites her um, former uh, or her, her brothers Gunther and Hagen to to celebrate um, with them. Um, on their way, the, the Donau maidens. So they're not Rhine maidens; they're Donau maidens. Um, it's like the, the, that's the largest. Yeah, the, the, well, and and Donau here is the the Thor character. 
Oh no, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean the river. I, I, don't, okay. I actually don't know if that's the same pronunciation in in English, the same name in English, but the largest river in Europe, the okay. Donau. Um, um, they, they, that river also has maidens. They predict the outcome, and in the in the end, they all die. So when I read this, it's like, holy crap! This is <laughs> Wagner didn't come up with any of the characters. He took them all from the lay, lay of the Nibelung. One one thing that this one doesn't have though is the ring. Um, but I did not read the Fall Song Saga, but I read a short a synopsis, and apparently the Fall Song Saga has the ring in it. And then along with the git, uh, with the gods, um, with Wotan and, and Donner and um, Loga, which basically, if you're more familiar and not familiar with the Teutonic gods and more familiar with like Greek or Roman gods, it's like that Zeus or like Odin and Norse mythology. It's, it's a lot of the, the Norse pantheon that you're yeah. looking at there. You know, Donner is Thor. Voltan is, it, it, you know, Voltan is Odin, Loge is Loki, so on and so forth. Yeah. And um, uh, Fricka in this is it's you know uh, very very much that the um, uh, the uh, oh my god uh, uh, Zeus's wife uh, Hera uh, it, like very clearly that role going through here yeah but so that after reading reading the lay of the Nibelung or the, the book and the novel adaptation of the lay of the Nibelung because again I couldn't sit through an eleven hour poem. Um, it became clear to me that what Wagner did was he just took all of those different characters and put them together. So if you want to translate that into comics nowadays, this is someone took over the X-Men book and said, all right, Wolverine and Jean Grey are brother and sister. Magneto is their father and they fight against this evil overlord that is Storm. Like, so, so it's the just, ultimate universe. It's super, so it's taking like, the mixed, same characters and then it's just like resetting the universe like and like shuffling it the completely again. Yeah. Like the yeah, because Brunhild, like, she was not a Valkyrie in the in the original, like or I shouldn't call it the original, like the inspiration. But this is like nowadays, if you did that, right? If you mix them up and you you say, well, Wolverine and Jean Grey are brother and sister, and um yeah i don't know magneto is their father um people would go nuts yeah that, uh, no that that's... was the that was the ultimate universe okay i didn't know uh, that, that was literally like the the plot of season three it was uh scarlet witch and uh pietro were lovers and and uh, magneto liked to watch them it was uh, it was weird All right man. i i'm not familiar with that but yeah, yeah okay. don't be don't be it's yeah. it's uh it, it's not good but that's what wagner did so he took all of that mixed it shook it up and mixed it together that's why i'm like when Tolkien says he wasn't inspired by Wagner, he was inspired by, by the Fall Song Saga. First, I haven't read that one, so I can't judge, but I really do not know. Obviously, yeah. naturally, he would always deny he was inspired by Wagner. What Wagner did, though, he kept that mythos alive. I don't think any of those stories would be known these days um, if it wasn't for the ring cycle. Um, he kind of kept those over the over the um, last, again, this is almost 150 years old. Um, I don't think many people would be familiar with, with, with the characters if it wasn't their introduction through the ring and then digging deeper, well, what was this inspired by? And going one step further and then finding that this was inspired by something else. And then who knows, maybe the lay of the Nibelung, um, it doesn't list an author. No one knows who wrote that poem. Um, it's so old that, that been, that's been lost. Um, but that person probably also had his or her inspiration in something else in, in the mythology of that time in stories that were told back then, obviously stories were told that, again, until the Roman empire arrived or, or settled like over 2000 years ago, stuff wasn't written down. The Roman empire like kind of introduced the, the form of documentation um, to, to most of Europe and Northern Europe. Um, and and that's where stories were then finally written down and and basically preserved. Um, again, we don't know where the original inspiration came from, but definitely Wagner didn't make up those characters. Yeah, and, and so it it might be a little bit reductive to say that um, you know that the the Gollum character came from this when so many of the characters, to your point. Are based on other things, you know, mythological figures. He's using a lot of, you know, these these sort of common gods and characters that are going in there. But 
again, uh, if if the ring was an invention as part of this, the Tarnhelm was, you know, you're saying it was part of the original, the lay of the nibble lung, but like the fact that there is specifically a ring and when paired with the Tarnhelm, the character turns invisible and it's this loathsome door is like, all right, you got a little something going there. Um, so that that was one of the immediate inspirations I saw. Um, the other one, and uh, uh, I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, um, th this is mentioned directly in Quentin Tarantino's uh, Django Unchained. So the Christoph Waltz character, he helps uh, Django when he hears that his quest is to retake his wife who has been taken from him by the, the slave master Leonardo DiCaprio. And his wife's name is Brunhild. And he says, you know, what good German couldn't help a hero on a quest to reclaim Brunhild? And, and so it's just like very clearly like this is, this is, these are themes that get repeated through and, and maybe Wagner is taking them and shaking them up and, and telling the same story that's there, but he's telling it and he's putting it out there. So again, very influential story. And, and I was glad to have had a chance to, to finally get to actually know the whole story as opposed to like, I get a little bit over here. I've got a little bit over here. I don't know how this part connects. That's awesome. Yeah, and definitely that that would have come from the ring because Brunhild in um, in the Lay of the Nibelung is very much more of a villain character. Um, she kind of causes, along with Kriemhild, two women, they're kind of causing the whole downfall there. But what, what Wagner did is he combined it with the gods, um, with, with the Nordic or Germanic, Teutonic, whatever you want to call them, deities. Um, that were not in the Lay of the Nibelung. There, there was no mention of the gods. There were no gods in, in the Lay of the Nibelung. Um, that's all what Wagner added to the story um, when he, he wrote the cycle. And it took him like 25 years to, to write the cycle um, of the four operas. Um, so much so I didn't first realize it when I read it the first time, but on second reading, there are no humans in the Rheingold. The Rheingold is solely solely about the goddess, um, the gods. It's about um, well, not only gods. It's um, Alvarez. You've got the Rhine maidens. You've got the Rhine Erda, maidens, Alvarez, You've got you Voltan. You've got the Nibelungs. You've got the giants. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I. But you I got no humans in there. I didn't think about that. Yeah. First time humans show up is in the Valkyrie. Well, and this is a beer for humans, so you know. Can't uh, can't can't be in. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, das Rheingeist. Uh, you can't be for the Rhine Gold. Sorry, my beer choice. It's over. It's terrible. Maybe they made it. That's a that's a sign that we got to talk more about uh, Siegfried, uh, Sigmund, and Sieglinde. <laughs> I I have a lot of thought about them um, as as a first time reader on this, um, and especially as they're portrayed in in these first two first and in, in the two versions, because I think uh, I. I got some thoughts as a first time reader. And not, no, not only as a first time reader. In fact, that's not only them, right? It's not only Sigmund and Sieglinde. It's later also Brunhild uh, and, and Siegfried. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, Wagner definitely had an obsession. And I was wondering, I tried to do some research. Was that acceptable during that time? But apparently, no. People, well, but but that's the whole thing. When Fricka comes in, like you know, she is saying it's not only that you know it's it's him uh, breaking the oath, and so Hogan, you know, who is the lawful husband. But it's like this is an unnatural coupling. Like she is coming in, and, and that's part of the whole thing that he has to slay the Valsung, is that it? This is uh, you know an affront to the gods, and you know when it's it's Sigmund and Siglina. Uh, it's, you know, it's supposed to be brought as this beautiful love story, which, by the way, in this version, all of these heroes are straight jerks. I, Sigmund just, like, runs into this guy's house, and he's like, oh, your wife is really pretty, and, like, Hogan just comes back, and he's like, yeah, there's this guy who's just murdering people, I just, like, came up, and he was like, oh, yeah, that was me, I was the guy murdering people, and it's like, dude, and he's like, yeah, I'm just gonna go marry your wife, and, like, I... I, I get that they're adapting a previous piece, but dude, Sigmund is a jerk in this version. In the uh, the Peacock Russell version, there's a little bit more time that you know they get to flesh out the characters, and and it it makes a little bit more sense, and you get to find out how you know Siglins was uh, was married against her will and all of that. But man, like in one of the things that I 
in this version is just like a lot of the heroes, if you were the first time coming in, they are like they're doing quote unquote heroic things, but they are straight jerks, man. But I, I think they're supposed to be jerks. I think that's the, the adaptation does take that from, from Wagner because Wagner wrote, especially Siegfried as a jerk coming out. Like he treats Mime as like the boy, like <laughs> at this point you don't even know like that Mime has like no, has only ill in intentions, but it's meant to come across like what well, this guy, this guy, I guess, part of his character development, he starts off as like he's treating his uh, adopted father like shit. And he hates the fact he's an orphan. Like, this he doesn't dude know cannot... first. He doesn't no, know first. That's, Before that's, he that's, knows that's, he's an orphan, he treats yeah, him for like, like 18 years. He's just like, he has this idea. Like, a guy doesn't need the no thong. He doesn't need, uh, you know, the, the needful sword to be, you know, to be forged. He needs some therapy. He needs some self help with this. Like, this man also, needs to find peace with himself because that was that was the thing is it, like I feel like the P. Craig Russell version in all of this I, I wouldn't say it modernizes it um, because it, it still feels very classic um, it doesn't it, it doesn't feel like sort of a modern telling of it but I think and maybe it's just the increased page count there's sort of more explanation to the P. Craig Russell version where it's like, you get a little bit more background of things are going and it's like, I kind of see this, but okay. I, it makes sense that it's supposed to be Wagner is showing Siegfried as a jerk. Cause that's how I was watching him walk through with me, man. I'm like, what are you doing dude? Like, yep. like I, I get that. Like he's not your actual dad. And I get that, you know, he's trying to get the horde himself, but for 18 years, this guy is taking care of you. I think that he wanted, maybe he wanted to show his character arc, starting as a teenager, misbehaved teenager, going through the growth and um, develop, de developing into an adult with more responsibilities. That is also a theme in um, the Lay of the Nibelung, where Siegfried is sent by the king. Again, he's a prince in that, but by the king, because he's misbehaved, he's being sent to, the, um, to, to a blacksmith that Mima, or, or I think or I think it was either Mima or Alberich, um, one one of the Nibelung, um, to to learn the art of making a sword with the sword, then he goes and slays the dragon. Um, so Wagner definitely copies it from that, and um, through through um, the actual opera, I think he's supposed to be a jerk in the beginning. Um, I don't know if it comes to. I, I didn't feel like the the actual character growth. Is, is portrayed that well because he just changes later once once meme is out of the picture um and he only yeah, treats me like that. that much <laughs> but yeah no to to your point that the the different versions they're definitely so different um and i counted pages because i was the same like how come that russell could relate a story so much better with so much more depth is it just a page count um I think the, the first one, the Rheingold, uh, definitely has like almost twice as many pages. Um, the other ones, though, there's only three issues uh, in Russell's um, and like 20 pages each um, compared to still 48 pages here. So it's like 50% more pages. So it's not quite double. He has like 50, 60% more space. But I don't think it's, it's only that. I think he just takes a different approach russell does like he he um kind of gives us um the character's motivations like he explains why they're doing things what where they come from um while um um roy thomas is just like retelling events and, and that that was exactly the way i looked at it so i started i i read through the majority of the book through here and then I, I picked it up and it, it very much feels like these guys are relaying the story of the ring uh the the p correct russell version is uh explaining the story of the ring and yeah it uh... i do have one problem with that because he is explaining it through his filter so his interpretation of the ring um which maybe where where also some of the comparisons to Lord of the Rings come from, because obviously um, P. Craig Russell was familiar with Lord of the Rings before writing this. And you can see it in some of the art where he, even the, the Eye of Sorrow, like he, he definitely 
takes inspiration from the Lord of the Rings and puts it back into this book as well. Like the Gollum character, like Hagen, he is like... Oh, it's almost like oh, a Ouroboros, a, a serpent eating its own tail. Yeah. Um, but he puts a lot of his own thoughts in this and why should events mm -hmm. be like this and why? what's the character's motivation that might not be explained in, in, in the actual opera. Um, but Russell kind of puts that interpretation into the book which then it becomes a better book, better story, but is it closer to the original? Um, and that, I don't, I don't know. That may be my only criticism of the, obviously this one, one best Eisner, like best, an Eisner for, I don't know what categories. Um, I think it were multiple categories. It was at least lettering, inking, I don't know, even the story, um, if it won, won it actually for, for, the, for the complete work. Um, but it is definitely the superior book. Um, I hadn't read it when I sent you the other one uh, because I was also going through, like I, I got, I didn't get the single issues when they were coming out. When was this in the eighties? <laughs> Obviously but, not. Okay, that was uh, another thing because I looked this up. So Gil Kane and, uh, and Roy Thomas are obviously, you know, two figures who are very famous for their work on Conan. And as I was reading it, I would have bet anything that this book was coming out in the 70s. Like this feels very much like this. This is 89 and 90. This is a fairly contemporary book. Yeah. It does not read like, like this is coming out the same time that stuff is like Watchmen, The Question, like a lot of that stuff is going, and I, and I get that. I mean, it's a 150 all. year old opera. Like they kind of want to stay true to the, to the source I, material that I, I the guess, language man, but... in there is, is old stuff, but the art, like, again, generally Russell does, he, he, like, he does the art and the story, right? Like this is, yeah, it's, it's, Russell's it's, uh, yeah, the, yeah, it's, there, there's some art in. Uh, but we, by the way, if we're talking about the art, I. This I want to I want this like forty by thirty. Oh, we're we're going right to uh, Gato Damaron. Uh, no, I just wanted to show my most favorite page <laughs> out of all of this. If, um, if if we're talking about our most favorite pages, um, I got to go with the P. Craig Russell version. Um, the the sort of prequel to uh, Das Rheingold, he's used it, it's the the air dust oh, yeah. story. So it's it's the prequel, like the the creation of the world tree. Uh, you you can see the the Norns in the background there, and it's just the beginning of it where it's just the blue line pencils, and it's you know you get the the dripping of blood, you get the creation of the world tree. Like like I wish the rest of it had just been done in blue line pencils, and then like. I, I am well, such you, you a get the, the 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 cycle closes right in the end when you basically if you hold up the first page I'll hold up the last page or the second to last page when basically the last drop drips down and I gotta get the blur out and creates the tree and you on the last mm -hmm. when, when, when the cycle so, closes so that was another thing that i wanted to um to talk about with that and i, I guess we're we're sort of jumping to that now is i'm sorry we can we can go just chronologically no, we're here on. we're here <laughs> they, I, no no we're we're doing this um so in in the p craig russell version you know so obviously um you know got the down wrong uh we talked about the you know the the uh commonality between the the teutonic version of the gods uh, the Norse version of the god. So Norse version of the god, the very classic death of the god story is Ragnarok. You know, we've, we've seen it in tons of different forms. The Walt Simonson Thor omnibus I have over there does it. We have Thor Ragnarok. Like, it is this classic story, but it's, it's a death and it's a rebirth in most modern versions. It's not just the death. And that's, you know, we see that with Gothard Bamarung, where in the P. Craig Russell version, it's it's a death of the current version of the gods, but it's a rebirth of, of the world anew. And we get all of that going and it's a hopeful end of the story. And, you know, we see the end of Siegfried, we see the end of Brunhild, you know, through all of that, with that funeral pyre, so too goes the hall of the gods, you know, uh, the Valhalla, which was the, 
you know, what, what started all of this off with, uh, with Botan's greed is burned down with all of them in it. But we see that little drop and we see the world tree anew. Here, nope, nope, Brunhild burns and so does Valhalla and that's the end. Everybody dies, good night, everyone. So I, I thought that was a, a really interesting version um, that the, the two of them were, were portraying. And I, I, I remember the novel adaptation didn't have their starting a new part either. So I don't know if that's Russell putting his take spin on it or if that's actually Wagner um, through the music, because he does a lot of things in the opera through the music. I listened to like a two hour opera explained where for the first time I actually, again, I'm not gonna sit there reading through the notes of and comparing what Wagner actually did in the music, right? Like I need someone to explain that to me. Uh, I would have never had access to that I, without that part. I, I listened to, when I was reading through uh, the, the Gil Kane, Roy Thomas version, I listened to the the um the the first cycle um das Rheingold while I was reading this and uh if you're wondering if this matches up with the music spoiler it doesn't and uh it makes it very hard to concentrate on the comic so I I think uh I I, I do think and in the back matter in the peak Greg Russell like he he talks about how he's breaking down he's how like there's a segment where he takes 12 notes and he breaks that into nine panels and, and there's like an interpretation that's going with that. And I think to your point, I, I think Russell is both putting his own spin, his own interpretation on it, but also he's taking story cues from the music itself as opposed to just what is being portrayed on stage. Whereas this is just very much, here's the story and we're just gonna give it to you and there you go, that's what you get. Yeah. I just tried to Google what, what the actual end of the opera. Uh, it just ends with, I mean, based on what I just found, it's like, um, it just ends with the fall, um, destroys the hall, Valhalla falls. Um, so I, I don't know if, if that's um, Russell's take on it that like, let's, but it's a cycle. It would make way more sense. And I'm sure it's somewhere in the notes because uh, they are listening to the explanation of, of what, the actual masterpiece. So the, the story again is like, okay, he takes lots of inspiration and he creates this epos um, that is like great. And it's, it's, it's um, this big story um, spread over four different operas, which had never been done before. And I, I don't think has been done since. Like if you listen to the opera, it's 16 hours um, over stretched over four days. Um, the actual masterpiece in this is that he invented multiple things. He Wagner did like he invented the music drama um, as a category. Before that, you had the Italian opera where they were just like singing for the sake of singing. No one understood what they were saying, and this is actually telling a story. I, um, for what it's worth, when I was listening to the Das Reinhold, I did not understand what anyone was saying. Oh yeah, I, I guess that's it, like it, that it, when it, they it, say this. I, I don't speak German. <laughs> That's another part, uh, another reason why I picked this book. I think in our first episode, you mentioned you have like German heritage. So I wanted to bring that out like a little bit. So uh, I picked a German book because you you said you have, you, you, you have I mean, uh, how, on, much, how many percent of you? On, on my, I mean, well, uh, like we joked when, when you came to this country and, and you were like, oh, I'm German. And everyone you met was like, oh, I'm German too. And you're like, oh, cool. We're like, where are you from? And they're like, oh, I'm from St. Louis. And you're like, oh, so you're American. Um, but yeah, my my grandmother, uh, she was a big genealogy nut. And like basically all of my family on my mother's side um, came from Bavaria. They came into the country in the, in the early 20th century. They were all from Bavaria. She has the family map to our earliest known ancestor, uh, who was a crusader named uh, Ivan von Zeller. So, you know, did, did you know him when you were living over in Germany? Did you did you run into a uh, Ivan von Zeller chap? Back in the from early, Bavaria. Back back in 1910, I think yeah, I yeah. ran into into them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. That that was that was my ancestor. Yeah, nice, so. nice. <laughs> um, but I saw I saw a little detour there. Um, the so he created mu the musical drama as a category. Um. He created the leitmotif, which nowadays you would call it theme song. He basically, every character had their own theme song. The sword 
the spear, everything had their light motif, which is the theme song. And what he did through the music was describing the events. He didn't even need people to, or a narrator to, to describe it because he had the big fight between um, Hunding and uh, Sigmund when they were clashing and Wotan is holding his spear and the, the spear clashes against the sword. He describes it through the music because the sword has its own th theme song a melody and the spear has its own melody and the melodies merging together becoming something new and then at that point the swords melodies fading out or like crippling down while the spears melody persists basically symbolizing that the sword broke while Wotan held his spear in there That's while later really in the clever. end when when um Siegfried um, shatters his spear, it's the other way around. Siegmund has a th leitmotif theme song, theme melody that is first underdeveloped as just a few notes when he first appears um, in, in Mimes Cave that develops further as he appears every time there's stuff added until it's fully grown later um, in, in his life. And then when he clashes with Wotan, then the Spears melody fades out and disappears in the end. While Hala, like the place itself, has its own like drum theme that disappears and has to submit to like the overall fire theme that also has its own melody, which is, I guess that's where we're in the opera, if we want to at least touch a little bit on the opera based on, on the opera explained part, at least. Um, is where the genius lies, all those interactions, all those things being interconnected and, and having their melodies attached or themes attached. I think, uh, I think in one of the versions, they touch on that a little bit, and I mostly skimmed over it because, you know, for this one, we were reading two books. Um, that is really clever, and that's, that's really, that's such a, a cool way to express sort of that mirror um, because uh, obviously, you know, Siegfried uh, is is killed by the spear that he uh, he swears on. I didn't even pick up that that was like a mirror of uh, of Sigmund, um, you know, the original nothing that he uh, he pulls from the tree, uh, being stabbed by what we know as Gungnir, but I, I don't think is ever named um, Vol uh, uh spear in this. That is that's such a cool way of expressing that through the music. Uh, again, uh, it's not that I figured it out because oh, no, 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 I am, you would yeah. have to sit there and read the notes and see, okay, this is like the the theme for this particular thing and then matching it with later because even just listening to it, I don't know if it would be that obvious unless you're like a music professor. I actually have to read the notes and figure out how they interact and what breaks away when. Um, but yeah, I, I found that kind of like mind blowing when I heard about the different. And there, uh, I can I can send you the link. I'll put the link in there to the Audible one, uh, Audible um, um, book, Opera Explained, The Ring. Um, it, it's I think two two and a half hours uh, because they use a lot of actually. Um, opera pieces to symbolize that they explain what's happening and then they play the song and you look at yeah you can hear the Valhalla drums like fading away as the flames take over it's pretty cool but again only cool if you know about it otherwise it's like oh man drums in the background <laughs> I don't know what that means yeah and again I I did not uh technically Valhalla is complete in in somewhere in Das Rheingold when uh you know I was listening to it but again it was a very weird experience too, because you know I'm reading uh, Das Rhein Gold, which is contained in like this many uh, pages. Like that's Das Rhein Gold versus four hours of an opera is Das Rhein Gold. So it's very com compressed, yeah. But uh, yeah, um, no, that's cool. I, I I had no idea about the light themes. Um, it's, uh, and and just like that theme music and that coming in. Did you read, uh, I think the trade paperback has an introduction in, in the beginning. It has a very long introduction, yeah. I, I was like, oh, I'll definitely read it. And then it was, uh, it was like 16 pages. Like that's the introduction right there. Um, and it's an introduction by Brian Kello of Opera News. And it starts off and like, you think it's just gonna be this like, oh, uh, you know, like it gives you a little basis on the ring and it, and it talks about how like, um, there's this problem of the modern interpretation, you know, if you're performing it, like, 
Are you taking it literally? Do you need to put dragons on stage? Do you need to do giants? Do you need to do all of that? And it's like, oh, that's cool. And then it's like, and that's why comics work so perfectly for you because you don't have to worry about it. And then it's like, oh, and it's got like the uh, the the photographs uh, for each of the different sections. And yeah, it's a very long introduction that goes into it. And I was like, man, I just gotta, I gotta start reading this. If this had been an afterward, it would have worked so much better. But like, come on, man, I want to read my comic book. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that it uh, touches on is the, the beginning of the opera where like it starts with nothing and then in the beginning is the creation. How do you put that on the pages of a comic book um, where I think Wagner starts in just E flat and he holds the tone, which I guess in music symbolizes like the absence of everything, which is the beginning of creation um, and how they wanted to portray that. And I guess, again, Russell does it better than... Um, yeah, because I, I mean, Thomas you, and Kane, because yeah, it's the, it's the there is no nothing, nothing here. Like, this yep. is the opposite of nothing. This is everything this is everywhere right in there. all at once. You get <laughs> what you get a double page uh, spread of that. You get a double page spread of that right there. And, and then after that, you know, you get the world is created. And again, you get a little bit of a history lesson. But yeah, the world is created here and like basically four pages. Whereas, you know, you start. With, with this beautiful idea um, on the, the Russell version of there is nothing and, and you don't even have the colors, you don't have the inks, it's literally the blue line pencil and then color is added in. But you're still colors on pencils, which I'm such a sucker for, for that as a, um, as a uh, comic visual. You know, one of my absolute favorite original art pieces I have is a Stuart Eminent from Secret Identity where it's like that whole thing is happening. Doug Braithwaite does it all the time. It's just like, put your colors on your pencils, like done, done. I love it. I'm, I'm on board. And so like I, when I was reading this part, I was like, oh, I can't wait for it. Like, look, I don't know how and it's going to fit. That, yeah, look at I that love eye. that part. But this is also something that's not in the opera, right? Like this is something that's added by Russell is, and everyone familiar with Odin, um, Votan well, in here it's it, like it, he it, sacrifices his eye for for getting the well the the, the norms talk about that at the beginning of Gotthard Damerung and so it's like it's him putting it in chronologically because in at the beginning of Gotthard Damerung when you know the when the rope breaks and basically they are shown that uh that fate is at an end they relay the sort of dying of the tree and they relay this story and so you get to go back, you get to see him drinking up the water, he gives up on his eye, he breaks off. So these are all things we know happen and it's it's things that are portrayed there. It's just shown chronologically. Got to open my second beer here. Oh, I'm, I was gonna say, I, I already did that uh, earlier. But there you go. Yeah. I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm still drinking my, uh, my beer for humans from a, uh, a musical movement that involves no humans, so. I, I am shamed now. That's all good. It's um, only the first part. If you want to talk about one that includes humans, um, something that I read was that Wagner only intended to write Götterdämmerung. So Götterdämmerung was the only opera he had intended to write. So he wrote that first. That's why it has the introduction of uh, by the Norns, right? Like you, you feel it's a little bit redundant for them to explain everything that you just read. Um, but it was the first opera that he wrote um, and because it was also musical so um, so relevant that he didn't cut out the norns in the beginning because it was also something that like never seen before um, and he felt after just writing Goethe demo it needed more explaining like it needed something because if you write just it read just Goethe demo by itself um, there's something missing like you, you where do they come from who are those people and so then he wrote um Siegfried and then he's like ah there's still I need to explain more he went back and and um wrote the um the Valkyrie um Valkyrie um and that was basically his opera and then he added later on or like before he even presented he he wrote the Rheingold but even in the cycle um the big premiere when it was first um performed 
um, the Rheingold counts as prologue. So the Rheingold was never part. He calls it a three-part opera with a prologue. So the Rheingold is the oh, prologue. Oh, kind of like the Lord of the Rings and uh, the, Hobbit the Hobbit isn't part of it. Is a, yeah. Is a, yeah, but no, no, no. Tolkien wasn't inspired by Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, but I found that fascinating. He's just like, ah, oh, the people won't understand. I have to write more. <laughs> All right, so if, if we're jumping to uh, Gut the Demerung, uh, especially at the beginning, talking about the Norns, can I just say how funny it is in the Gil Kane, Roy Thomas version coming off of Siegfried when you know you, you end it and he has braved the fire, he has gone up, he has met Vernhild, he has finally learned fear at, at the trembling, and it's just like, I mean, honestly, you could have ended the story right there. And like, that would have been a complete story of the hero slays the dragon, he finds the love, and that's it. And then you start got to Damarog and it's like, well, see ya, I gotta go. That is not explained anywhere. Um, I tried to find out why does he leave Brunhilde because he goes later back with the Tarnhelm not knowing who, she, who he is or who she is and like takes her. Why didn't she follow him? There was not she, really... She's just hanging out in her fiery circle. Like she's been asleep this whole time. She wakes up and he's just like, ah, I gotta go. Uh, it's just like, it's... it's it is... <sighs> He so, pulled like a one night stand, and she's like, "Oh, you gotta are like, are you gonna go get bagels for it?" He's like, "No, but that's the part. Gotta... That's the only part I could explain it. So, because they didn't consume the marriage, I want to call it like that for a public YouTube channel. Uh, <laughs> they didn't make out. They, they, uh, the sword lay between them. Yeah, yeah. That is uh, actually that's. I think that's in the Russell one. It's like the sword was between us. I, I think actually both." I, I'm pretty sure both of them include that in there. Like I, yeah, because it's a weird detail to put in there, but. Because I think, so again, it isn't really explained even in the novel, uh, in the um, novelization, it's not really laid out, but yeah, you have to put it together. So if, if you have the same takeaway, like they didn't actually consume their marriage um, because that's the curse that Wotan puts on Brunhilde, right? Like the, if you're being wed, you lose all your powers, you lose your independence, you become nothing but a wife. Um, and, and you lose your identity, you lose who you are. Um, she's already not a Valkyrie uh, anymore. But for her to lose who she is and just become like, I'm just married to this guy now, even though she loves him, she doesn't want to give that up. That would be to me the only reason why she stays there and later is forced off and kind of that's so that's the, that's kind of the curse but again to me when the curse is laid out it, it initially read to me that like no the one that goes through the fire claims you but then that's it the fire should disappear i don't know why the fire is still there after well because then you know uh, otherwise gunther could just go himself and you know no, that's uh, why she should just leave the rock why yeah she, why does she stay on the rock after a secret so, already found her so that is one thing. And, and again, I don't know if this was an invention of Russell or if this was um, him trying to explain it. But in the Russell version, it's not a great explanation, but it, you know, in, in Gothard Damarong, I, I think it's beginning Gothard Damarong and not the end of Siegfried. But I mean, either way, it's, it's Brunhild who says, like, you are a hero. You still have great heroic needs to, uh, you know, deeds to do you must go. And then they exchange, you know, she gives him uh, her horse, he gives her the ring. But again, it's just like, I don't get just what she loves there. so much. Yeah. Why does she love that fiery rock so much? What is it about that? Like, so this I woman to, was a Valkyrie. This bugged me so much. I tried to Google and there were some Google explanations that said um, that Loga, so Loki's character, like, yeah. uh, Loga um, tricked him, uh, tricked them um into um secretly leave, leaving again i wasn't in either of the comics that was not in the novelization again the novelization um the adaptation uh, that i read was not for necessarily only adults so they they whitewashed a lot of stuff for young adults because they left a lot of things out the bloody slaughtering the sexual parts um mm. which i get but again the only version that's available <laughs> like otherwise i have to actually listen to the opera um if i wanted to find out more so that's why I also appreciate the comics more because they're like, this one is actually rated M, right? Like 
uh, lots of boobs in here. Um, um, but that they actually probably, again, I don't know because I didn't listen to the, or read the opera, um, how much they more realistically or more authentic um, the, the, this rep representation is. But yeah, in the novelization that was not explained either. Um, just online, I found some explanations of like, no, Logan tricked them into a secret leaving and Brunhilde is staying there. It's like, but that, again, that wasn't in the comics. No, I, I mean, literally in this, it just like, it's this huge triumphant moment. And then it's the equivalent of, uh, of Siegfried being like, I gotta go. I gotta, you know, this, this has been great. <laughs> said, when uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's nice. Just, it, oh, this is, I, I, I got this thing. Like, see, I'm, I'm this big hero. I got heroic deeds. You, you get it. You get. It. I'm, I'm gonna go. And it's just like, wait, what? But it, like, this was the whole point. Like, he, his whole thing is he, he doesn't know fear. He doesn't know fear. Oh, he's learned fear. He's, you know, from this woman. It's. You know, the, the curse that was placed under the Valkyrie, it's just, ah, it doesn't matter. It's just, he's gone. Love taught him. Um, love taught him fear. <laughs> That's speaking, the takeaway. <laughs> speaking of love, I, um, this, this was another thing that, that kind of got at me. Um, so if we go back to, uh, to Sigmund and Sigmund in, uh, in the Valkyrie. And insist. No, not just that. Like, that's... You know, I, I, I love Game of Thrones. Uh, well, uh, Song of Ice and Fire and then Game of Thrones, like whatever. I, I, can, I can deal with a little incest in, in my high fantasy. What I thought was so funny in this version, it, it's less so in the P. Craig Russell version, but again, um, we talked about how like this is kind of relaying the story. They don't really explain anything. So they kind of take some things for granted. It almost seemed in this one because you know he he comes up um and in uh, sigmund isn't sigmund when he he first comes upon her he is woeful uh and and he explains that uh you know uh he doesn't have a name uh you know if you must call me anything call me woeful because my story is so sad i'm i'm tormented and, and and goes through all of that and then it goes through and it's almost like you know he's just like okay cool give me a name and she's like okay uh, you're my secret twin brother and we were separated at birth, but now we're to be married. And he's like, cool, I'll be that. And it's just like, it, it, it's all very convenient. And it's almost like, it almost seemed more like they were role-playing where she was just like, hey, yeah, yeah, you can go ahead and do it. And I, and I get that that's actually what it is, but just the way that it was explained here, he's just like, you can call me anything you want and and she's just like you're gonna be my brother and this is a thing he's like eh, if it works for you not only that it's it's not that they were separated at birth right they were separated when they were already like older kids teenagers almost like how do you not recognize someone like they they weren't that i i thought like, it was they younger babies like but weren't they because it, I know, it maybe, almost maybe seemed like misread it, that, but. it at least Again, there's more, there's more elaboration in the Russell version, but it almost seems like Sigmund is the one who like identifies him. And, and there's this whole thing about like, oh, she's so familiar. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I see in her eye, there's something and, and, and holding, uh, you know, when he's there, he's just like, they look so alike. There's something about it. And and of course the gods themselves are proclaiming um, that the, uh, the the brother sisterhood thing is there, but like he never necessarily recognizes her. At least in these comic adaptations, he identifies himself only as Wolfung. He's the Volsung, um, and and it's just literally like, yeah, call me what you will. And and she kind of comes up with that, and he's like, cool with me. Like he never really confirms it. He's never like, I remember you. I recognize. He's just like, if that's if that's cool with you, I I could go with that. And it was just, again, that was very very funny to me as something that's like this huge thing, where he's like, cool, yeah, I, I could be that for you. Yeah, and that's all by Russell at least told through the black and white um, 
inks. And, I, I and thought that trying, in, in I don't the Russell know version, it was very artfully done. I, I, I appreciated the way that he did that. I was born twin to a sister, the son and daughter of Wolfie, Fiat of many, yada, yada, yada. But there, well, let me, again, the blur. So we're gonna go away and, and then the next page. Isn't that him standing back to back with his dad? So this, if that's the moment of separation. Yeah, that's that's him at Votan, who was, uh, you know, who was a wolf, uh, as as he was called. But yeah, that's, he's not, again, it doesn't explain when they were separated. But at this point, if yeah. that was the point of separation, but of my sister, there was no trace. They're not babies, they're adults. Like, and how do you not remember how your sister looked like? <laughs> if you were separated Again, when you were older but I, yeah. in in my little knowledge that you know i am i am gonna float the uh the the fan theory this is this is happening we are making a fan theory for a 200 year old opera four-part cycle that they were not actually siblings but just sigling had always had a role-playing interest in doing a, a, a brother-sister thing. They never were, and he just went with it because he was in love with her. That's my theory. I'm going for it. That makes um, sense because also, otherwise, how can they give birth to a son like Siegfried that doesn't have 11 fingers? Um, but actually, I mean, this it's, heroic it's, it's, hero, it's, and then he, Siegfried himself... <laughs> So, so there is an increased likelihood. It, it is not, you know, as you go down more, the, the, the genes get more interspersed, but one generation uh, it does not necessarily make that. I mean, just look at the House of Windsor and look at what happened there and the fact I that I guess Br Brunhilde doesn't have a baby in the end. So otherwise that would be already second, two generations based on. All right. If, I, if we're talking about strange pairing things i you know and we're going back to brunhild and we're talking about the fact she doesn't have a baby okay can you can you explain to me a little bit about the complete 180 that happens with brunhild and gotha damarung where siegfried is being you know so uh he drinks the potion he forgets about brunhild he he marries uh gunther's sister uh, or, or takes her as wife doesn't like marry her but you know takes her as wife and there's the whole thing there and Brunhild finds out, and she's so jealous that she's basically like, here's how to kill him to uh, uh, to the, the Gunther half-brother, the son of Alberic. And, and then basically, as soon as he's dead, which is set up by her hand directly, she's just like, none of you knew the hero that he was. I am coming to be with you. And I get it's a whole thing of honor, but it's like, lady, you just set this up. And even like... Um, uh, 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 Gunther's sister like even says that to her and like he, you know she acknowledges like I was never the true bride it was him I you know he was tricked but she's like but you were the one that just killed him like what are you doing I think yeah maybe three things so one is the um I think she did she didn't find out initially that it was based on this magic potion that he drank like first he denied her she saw him with um with um, Gunther's sister again, I keep forgetting the names because it was Creamhild in the other version. Um, Tr Trothild, something with T. No. Gutrum. Gutrum. Ah, good. Yeah. I, I opened randomly. It also doesn't right help to that, the page. It also doesn't help that they have different names in English and German. So it's Gutrud or Gutrun. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's a, a, a name which means good runes. In case you're wondering. Oh yeah, and no, no, I, I know someone who's actually called like that. Um, there you go. Yeah, still a name that's in use. Good uh, one is. Um, anyways, so that that's like her her feeling betrayed starts before she finds out that that was like Hagen. Um, but again, yeah, why doesn't she give like like some? There's and there's also no remorse when she's like yeah no there's remorse, no no remorse. like it, it's it, like well it's he wasn't tricked it wasn't his fault but I yeah and, and it's it's said in front of her and and there's no like oh you know my sweet siegfried what have i done she's like she stays as like justified there and then eventually obviously she jumps on the funeral pyre you know on on the horse but it, like the whole time she I, that 
the second part, so again, this is the first one. The second one is that's the, in the source material. So the layer of the Nibelung is basically the, the whole downfall of mankind or them, all, all of the kingdoms. It comes from, um, from Kriemhild, um, Gudrun in here, um, and Brunhild that are basically just full of jealousy and battling it out and having kingdoms move against each other um, based on their jealousy over Siegfried um, because Gru um, Brunhild um, thinks she should be with Siegfried but Siegfried has no interest in her um, and then but Siegfried helps Gunther to um, with the Tarnhelm similar situation not on a fiery rock but like in her castle gets her because she's also a Valkyrie-like figure, um, has the strength of 10 men given to her, which she would only lose if she was um, to marry. Um, and she would not only um, give that up if she was married to Siegfried. So that comes all from that mythos. So if Wagner just took it from there, then that's probably why. Um, why um, Brunhild is so uh, vengeful and kind of lets that loose on them because in the lay of the Nibelung, it's, it's also um, good, uh, um, uh, Brunhild who makes Hagen and Gunther kill Siegfried. Um, and then the third part is just the different times back then, I think the, the honor system was way big. Like if you gave your word, that was the law. Like you gave your word, you shook your hand, you do the blood oaths, like blood brothers. Right, and you know, that and was then when it's called, they, you know, they then like hold their hand on the spear and it's that they, whole thing. Because they didn't have any other like honor system. Like if you gave your word and you said something, you, you honored that. In the lay of the Nibelung, someone says like, yeah, I will stand by you no matter what. And then even against this, well, he has to go and die um, because he gave his word. So uh, maybe that's that's part of the big epos the big um heroes myth um in the mythology that like yeah i give my word i i you dishonor me i take it to the grave i still love you i don't that, that would be my interpretation but yeah modern time it doesn't hold up these days where everyone's like eh, i'm not gonna die for this <laughs> i know what forgiveness is too and yeah i think it's just different times too like again this was written and i i totally get that aspect of it like i i read the uh, ramayana a few years ago and and like there's a whole as part of the introduction like they talk about um when uh when it appears that uh that rama has been killed um his wife is is about to like throw herself at a funeral pyre and like a lot of modern interpretations have some problems with that and so there have been some some ways of like dancing around it where uh, you know different things happen with that and, like I get different time different values honor is, is done differently again it's it's more for me that it's just like she never doubts that what she did was right like even when she's given the information that like he was tricked he was never like willfully unfaithful to you she's just like it when he was alive it was like he has to die and then as soon as he died it's like you all never appreciated him like i did it was you know i did the right thing. i don't know that, that was a little strange to me i feel in the end he just she just wants to bring the guts down at some point because she figures out that it's all Wotan's fault like yeah well and, and yeah and and that's the thing is just like you know it, you know you get that scene where you know her sister comes and says you can save all of Valhalla if you just you know give the the ring back and she's just like i don't care about any of that she curses Voltan's name and and you know then all all goes from there so at that point like she knows i'm not living this thing out i'm just here to see them all all go down and in the end she throws the ring back to the rhine maidens um i mean it doesn't really help yeah um, and then uh and then hold on obviously does his jumping in trying to get it um, and they all drag him down. Uh, uh, so speaking of that, so we see, um, so uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Hogan is, is Hogan? Hagen. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so we find out that Hagen is the son of the Nibelung uh, Alberic yep. uh, from you know, Dothrangold. And, you know, he's like, there's this whole thing of them working together. And so Hagen obviously is, is dragged down by the Rhine maidens at the very end of it. Um, you know, they're, they're all laughing while that happens. Do we ever get a resolution for Alberic? I, because he shows up at the beginning, he's like, get it and we'll rule it together. 
And I feel like we don't ever see anything from him. I think after. in the end, everyone dies anyways, right? It's not only the end of the gods, it's the end of everything, including humans, Nibelungs, and every like everything just resets, disappears, and gets created anew. Because that's why we don't have Nibelungs in this world and no giants here anymore. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's the only to, plausible explanation why we don't have Nibelungs. To your point, in the uh, the the Gotthard Damarung page at the very end, we see Albert Rex, uh face among the flames uh, of like all the little faces, um, including a whole bunch of people that are already dead. But yeah, yeah he's he's one of the faces everyone dies. Like it's Ragnarok for everyone. Yep. So um, you know, we've been we've been talking now for a while. Uh, we've We've talked a lot about how uh, some funny things about this book. We've talked about some things, um, but I'm curious, uh, you know, with both of these versions, you know, kind of coming through at the end of it, what are what are your lasting thoughts from these? Like having read both of these versions now, um, you know, do you do you feel like you understand the story better? Do you feel like you appreciate the story better? What you know, where do you come off of these two? I, I definitely understand the story better. Um, again, my only exposure before was like a little bit more reference to the lay of the Nibelung, which I didn't know at this time when I went in and, and uh, read the novelization um, of this. It was more like me expecting um, the story of the lay of the Nibelung, which my teacher had relayed to me like two decades before. Um, and then their part also being more a young adult novel. So with the comics, I definitely understand this more. And through the comics and especially our discussion, I would have not listened to the opera explained for two and a half hours if it wasn't for us talking about it. Because so I was like, well, I should prepare myself a little bit more. Ben probably expects me to know about the opera where I've never been to an opera before. Um, but we're going to talk about this book. So yeah. Um, I do appreciate, I, I, when I first listened even the young adult novel um, in German, I really loved the story. I think it's a, an, an epic tale that I have no idea how this hasn't been made into a movie. Um, maybe it's- It was, a, it was called The Lord of the Rings. There was uh, three of them and then they split. Uh... Yep. I don't know if it's based on the source material. Again, Wagner has a very, um, uh, how how can I say this? Very critical or very disputed stand, especially based on how Hitler used him, and also on Wagner's views. But again, 150 years ago, I I want to find a person that that thought differently about minority. About again, he he was considered a, an anti-Semite um, against Jews, which throughout his life seems. Again, I, I want to mention that here because yeah, if you if you kind of, if you talk about an author or like about the creator of this, um, we gotta we gotta talk about that for a second too. Um, that that is not without um, without that right. Like he he was considered a big anti-Semite, which is not great. You gotta separate the, um, the, um, the artist from the art. Yet, if you look at this it doesn't come through through his work like he he uses some of the attributes how jews were perceived back then um for for the nibelung yet he especially in the opera explained person it's like through the music and also through the story he describes he doesn't albrecht and meme are not always the bad guys they the scenes where where Wotan wrangles the ring off of his finger, rips it away. You feel empathy, and like Wagner felt empathy for for um, Alberic in that situation. Through the music, that through the story, you can see that now he's not blaming them. He's like portraying them as the victims. Um, and and later on, like I mean, Wotan and and even also Secret, anyone else like doesn't come come out of this un. Um, and scarred so it's it doesn't hold up in in this particular piece of work um, so that it's got to be separate um, but um, maybe that's also one reason um, Wagner's reputation that this hasn't been made into a big movie again hasn't hasn't stopped other masterpieces from being made 
um, just because they were created by by an author um, or by a person that was uh, has a has a dubious uh, stand in history. But yeah, I have no idea. Like you can make this into a great tale, into a great well, not only trilogy again <laughs> with a with a prelude, and into a saga, um, a big budget movies that people would watch and it would keep that mythos alive just as Wagner kept the lay of the Nibelung and the Fersung saga alive with his piece um, that he created, The Ring and uh, modernization, I think would keep that mythos alive as well. Yeah. I don't know. What, are you, what are your thoughts? So I, again, I, I go back to um... When when I open the package, and again, anyone who is uh, who has gotten this far, if you're interested, um, there's a reaction video I have where, like, I open this up, and and it is very much that like clay meme because I'm like, what am I holding in my hands? Like, how is this a thing? And it just, I was like, I I don't I don't even know what to think about this, and um, and and like in reading it again, I I realized like how little I actually knew about the ring because it's so famous. It's, it's in so many, you know, like different uh, things that we know. It's just, it's part of pop culture to a certain extent um, that I was like, Oh yeah, sure. I, I, I know the story of it. And it was like, by reading this, it was like, Oh, Oh, I didn't actually really know it. And, and it was really interesting to be able to experience it. And I'm so glad that we did both the the Gil Kane Roy Thomas version and the P Craig Russell version uh, because if we had if we had just done this I don't think I would have had the same appreciation for the sort of the ring story that that I would have because you know this this is again um, this is relaying the information in all of its silliness in all of its two hundred year oldness. Whereas the the Russell version kind of adapts it, and and we see it through his particular uh, lens. But you know, I think this is to your point. It is very clearly this epic story, and we see so many other things that are influenced by the things that are here. And again, this is influenced in turn by the lay of the Nibelung uh, that's going there. And and you know we're you know there's the whole thing we, we've been telling each other the same stories like since the dawn of time it's just you know the, the the hero's journey is the basis for every modern story you you have all of that there but you know if you had not sent this to me uh there is about a zero percent chance i would have ever read either of these things here it just like wouldn't have been on my radar and and so i i want to thank you for putting this here because like I said I I, I would have to, if someone was like oh yeah how well do you know the ring I'd be like I don't know I know, I know the ring all, all right and they're like no no I, I don't and this uh this forced me to sort of like get out of my comfort zone both with reading um you know seeking out the Rhine gold to actually like listen to it and it was it was a really cool experience and I I really appreciate that happen awesome I'm, I'm glad um I'm glad you liked it. And again, so many more people could benefit from that if it was made available. So Dark Horse, <laughs> anyone wants just we need a reprint of the hardcover or Let's, whatever. If, if, if they want to put out a library edition of the P. Craig Russell version, I have been trying to be better about budgeting. I've been trying to talk down, but that is a day one purchase for me. What I learned through this, they could do, they could do a box set because P. Craig Russell didn't only do this. He did the magic flute. He did, he did uh, 12 operas. Yeah. He adapted 12 operas. I think this is the 10th, the 9th or the 10th one in that. Um, so he talks about there's letter pages in here. I haven't read them all, but uh, the single issues have all the letter pages. And he talks about, just read a few um, later on. Um, talks about how this is like the ninth or the tenth one he already knows what the last two will be and um he adapted 12 different operas that i'm sure i have never heard of any of the other 11 or what well, maybe heard of them but don't know what they are about if they want to put out a box set with 
like just be Craig Russell's opera epic. Um, do it. Like I'm sure there are people buying that stuff um, and they want to test the waters with just reprinting the hot cover um, or library edition. Yeah, this this the art is great in this. Like this, this needs to be this needs to be oversized. Give me all of the blue line pencil and colors on the pencils. Like I want all of that. Yes. Yeah, this was this was great. I'm I'm really glad that we read this. And like I said, definitely not something that I, I would have picked up on my own. So thank you for for forcing me uh, to have a bit of culture in my life. Just a little bit. Um, no, I know you um, you appreciate culture, and that's why in the movie club yesterday we discussed some movies there that I think you would appreciate. Um, that are not mainstream. Um, so yeah, everyone needs a little bit culture. <laughs> I know it's getting, it's past midnight for you. Um, it is, and actually right after this, um, tomorrow we're we're going down to uh, uh, go see an art retrospective for Maurice Sendak, uh, including some of the original art for Where the Wild Things Are. So I'm gonna be away this weekend. So actually, as soon as we get off of here, I've got uh, a video to film so that I can I can keep hitting my uh, my Monday streak. So, yeah, I'm uh, you know that's a life of a hashtag influencer. Yeah, yeah, you're you're busy. You're, uh, it's two days until Monday. We we expect the video on Monday. So we're not gonna talk about Kaiju score steal from the gods because you you got your video. Yeah, no. If if you want to hear my thoughts, uh, you know you can uh, you can go watch that video, or inevitably you can uh, just uh, watch our video the next time we do this. And and even if we're not talking about Kaiju score steal from the gods, we'll do that. But yeah, I. Uh, I, I actually, uh, spoiler alert, in uh, this video that I'm putting up on Monday, um, I am mentioning you. You, uh, you will be coming up on the on this video that's coming up. And uh, not to spoil it, um, but a it, it's going to be the culmination of something a long time coming. I can't wait now. My anticipation is don't, through the roof. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> it is, it is so much worse and so much more disappointing than you think. But uh, yeah, it. Uh, I I was getting some assets ready, and I was like, uh, what? What is that? I was like, oh, it was Torsten. Okay, okay, all right. So yeah, okay. you will you will in some capacity be showing up on Monday's video. Again, Sounds good. I'll, don't uh, don't get I'll too excited there. for it. It's uh, it's not gonna be that good, but it's it's uh, you'll be there. I'll be there to watch it. Um, thank you for joining. Um, the Warriors and the Celtics, unless they meet in the finals, won't meet again this season. But I'm sure we'll find another. We will we'll find some other occasion to bet on and and um, take this to episode uh, four and beyond. Um, <laughs> not having to wait another year. So it'll happen. We'll be there. All right. Thanks, Ben. All right, later, buddy.